I'm sure you've heard of people saying things like, we don't know how Bitcoin is going to perform in a recession. We don't know what's going to happen when the recession comes. We don't know when this, that, and the other, right? That is a thousand dollar net worth of comment because risk assets are no longer linked to the real world. They're linked to liquidity cycles. Now, if someone says to you that the liquidity cycle or the liquidity in the world is shrinking and therefore risk assets might not do as well, that's one thing. But what happened in the greatest recession in recent memory in 2020 when the world was forced to shut down was that the liquidity increased and the risk assets went up even though the world was in a recession. So recessions are not really uh, indicative of what's going to happen to a risk asset like Bitcoin at this point, right? Um, so it's very, very important to distinguish between the two. Now, we might have a continued credit shrink, and that could affect the price of Bitcoin and the credit cycle could affect it. But the credit cycles are not linked to recession. They want people out of jobs so that they can print more money and boost the boost the asset prices up. Like that's this is how the system works. So to say that you need, you know, you need to worry about how Bitcoin is going to do in a recession. I'll tell you how it's going to do. It's going to do fucking amazing in a recession because what's going to happen is. The recession is going to happen. Something's going to break. They're going to print a bunch of money, and that money is going to go into risk on assets, and, and risk on assets will do well, like they always do. So while this recession argument is interesting, the one – it's not really interesting. But the one thing that I was thinking about was that you could argue that Bitcoin was alive during the, 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 the 2009 financial crisis, right? But it wasn't a big enough asset to really pay attention to. But what is interesting is they always say, oh, Bitcoin's never experienced a recession. But you know what Bitcoin truly has never experienced? A demand shock, right? Bitcoin has a programmed supply shock. But it's never truly experienced a demand shock. I was thinking about this a few days ago and I started doing some research into it. There's always two levers on any asset, right? There's the demand lever and the supply lever, right? And we already know what's going to happen to Bitcoin's supply lever. It stays strong because it's fixed. Every four years, the supply goes down by 50% and it stays there. No matter what I do to try and influence this supply, no matter how much demand goes up and down, this supply never changes. It stays fixed. Whereas the demand lever can crank up or crank down. Like we see, we have the ups and downs in the bull and bear cycles. So I started asking myself, like, what has happened you know, during these bull market runs that everyone talks about? What has actually happened in terms of the demand level, like has that gone up or down or what's actually happened? So the best information I could find, and I would love somebody else if they could clarify this uh, and send me some corrected information if I'm wrong. The best information I could find is that in the 2021 cycle, there was roughly 40 to $50 billion that went into crypto. That includes the NFT monkeys, the Solana, the Ethereum, the VC bullshit, everything. And so you think about that and you go, well, what would have gone into Bitcoin? And let's say it's somewhere between 20 and $25 billion went into Bitcoin. It kind of makes sense when you think about it, right? MicroStrategy was a few billion dollars. It can't really have been much more than $25 billion gone into that cycle. And that was the cycle that took Bitcoin from $3,500 a coin to $69,000 a coin with just $20 billion, $25 billion. Because we all know that the price of Bitcoin is set at the margin, right? So that $25 billion, you divide it by 21 million, it's not going to look like anything. But you divide it by the actual amount of Bitcoin that were available to sell, and you now start understanding that the price is set at the margin. And go watch my video on price being set at the margin if you want further clarification on that. So yes, $25 billion coming into the market is enough to take the market cap of Bitcoin from, you know, three or 400 billion to a trillion dollars. It's absolutely enough. And that's where Bank of America study and, and, and that whole video on the bull market multiple came in. So the point here is, is that Bitcoin's really had, you know, 20 to 30 billion dollars worth of demand shock. That's nothing. There's 300 trillion dollars in real estate. And then I started thinking about like, OK, well, 
if what would be a demand, what would be a true demand shock for Bitcoin? And then you start started looking at some front strat research and they started saying that right now Bitcoin's price is being maintained where it is with $25 million of purchasing on a daily basis. So that is $25 million of Bitcoin wants to be bought and $25 million worth of Bitcoin wants to be sold and the price stays at its equilibrium level. And we already know that every four years the supply goes down by half, so the supply makes the price move up to here, and then if the equilibrium, either the demand goes away or the price has to come up to meet it, right? So the price has to increase to meet the supply shock. But what about the demand shock? And Funstrat themselves say they could, they could see unlocking, you know, $100 billion of, of purchasing in the ETF within the first year. And then recently Mark Yusko said he could see... $300 billion being uh, allocated to Bitcoin because of the ETF. And then you start realizing that Bitcoin has never, ever, 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 never truly experienced a demand shock. All of these morons are going on about their recessionary doom and gloom bullshit. Bitcoin has never experienced a moment where, like Tesla did, where suddenly every Russell 2000 fund manager needed Tesla in their portfolio, otherwise they were losers. And the stock went from 11 to $400. That's never happened to Bitcoin, ever. And everyone's worried too much about the downside shocks. What about the upside shocks? So you take that 300 billion that Mark Yusko was talking about, and it, it, how markets work, it's never gonna come in exactly like I'm gonna calculate. Because it's not like $300 billion says, okay, I'm going to divide myself by five years and then go into the market on a daily basis evenly. There's always a, a, a you know, speed bumps in the way and then there's a slowdown, et cetera, et cetera. And, but you can't really analyze that. You have to analyze it on a daily way of doing it. So I took $300 billion and there's 252 trading days in a year. And I averaged it over five years. <laughs> I averaged it over five years, right? Um, because I think that's a reasonable, reasonable demand shock over five years, $300 billion of new purchasing. And so there's 252 trading days in a year, so there's 1,260 trading days over a five-year window. And $300 billion divided by 1,260 gives us $240 million a day worth of purchasing. So suddenly you sit there and you go, the equilibrium price currently is being held where it is by $25 million a day of purchasing. And Mark Yusko is saying that $300 billion could come into the market, which could increase the daily demand, not the supply, the demand by 10x. And if the demand goes up by 10x and the supply goes down by 50%, what is this new equilibrium price? And if we were to ignore the fact that the price is set at the margin, ignore the fact that there's only less than 2 million Bitcoin on exchanges, ignore the fact that, you know, 4, 5, 6 million Bitcoin have been already lost, ignore the fact that there's other vectors of demand that could come into this as the, as the game theory takes over, you're looking at Bitcoin price going from 25,000, which is what it is right now, the equilibrium price, to... 250,000 as an equilibrium price based on just this level of demand coming into the market. This doesn't include PayPal and other banks figuring out, okay, we have a $7 trillion Forex market and we can use Bitcoin rails to do international settlements on an instant basis. And we need to put $2 trillion of that $7.5 trillion into Bitcoin and hold it there to allow the transactions to happen over the rails of Bitcoin. That's not included in this. This is just $300 billion of daily purchasing over the next five years coming into Bitcoin and in a, in a normal daily fashion. This is not panic mode. This is not, oh my God, I need to get into it. This is not the Hunger Games. This is just standard, slow, daily buying that's coming in. And then this doesn't include, you know, the wealthy people that are getting involved. This doesn't, oh, one of the other things is people always think that as the price of Bitcoin goes up, the supply on the market is going to get better. That's not true. Not only do you have finality of supply on this asset, which means that people are going to want to hold on to it, 
80% of people already hold on to it, despite what happens to the price. Then you've got the new buyers that are coming into the market. Sure, the $1,000 net worth, there's the $10 a month DCA gang, the, you know, those people, the doom and gloom boomers may sell some of their Bitcoin, and that's fine. But the new buyers that are coming in are sophisticated. The new buyers that are coming in know how to generate liquidity on assets without selling them safely. They know how to hold on to these assets forever. They know how to buy and hold forever. That's who's coming into this market. So, no, it's not true that when the price goes up, the supply has to increase in the market. And even if it does, there will be some turnover. It'll be bought and sucked out by these people who will never, ever sell. The true definitions, the true vanguards of bullish as fuck are coming into this market. And so you start thinking about it and you go, you know, what happens when the price starts accelerating to the upside because of this new demand? And then it becomes emotional. Right? People try and compare this to real estate. It's not like real estate. It's not like single family fucking homes where you're sitting there going, oh, does the cash flow make sense in order for me to make this investment? Bitcoin is like prime real estate. It's like number one Hyde Park in London. Right? where you show up if you've ever had the blessing to be in an auction house when you know a prime piece of property is up for sale and all the rich guys are in the room you realize how emotions takes over it's like okay this apartment is going for 30 million and one guy will put his hand up and say i'll give you 38 i want it why are you giving 38 i don't, i want that apartment i want it i need it and another guy puts his hand up and says i'll give you 42 so now you've got an apartment that was on sale for 30 million because it's prime real estate is now selling for 42 million. That's before the next guy stands up and says, I'll give you 48. So that is the true hunger games that starts on prime assets. And Bitcoin is absolutely a prime asset because of the scarcity of it. That's why that London property is a prime asset because of the scarcity of it. It's the prestige of it. That's real Hunger Games on, on, on assets that have not come. We have not come anywhere close to this yet. So you've got the price accelerating to the upside. You've got the Hunger Games starting with the, with the wealthiest people on the planet. They're looking at the price going, it just went from 100 to 150. I need to buy some of this. I need to jump on board. They jump on board. It goes up. Now they're incentivized to hold on to it longer. So it goes up even more because the price is set at the margin. Now this $300 billion is now looking at this market going, wait a second, I'm going to miss out. I thought I was going to allocate over five years. If I don't allocate it right now, I'm going to miss out. So then this $300 billion goes, okay, I'm going to, instead of doing it over 1260 days i'm going to do it over 500 days which is two years two 252 trading days in a year and now there's 600 million dollars of daily demand going in when the equilibrium demand was 25 million this is how the hunger games begin and bitcoin has never ever in its history ever experienced a demand shock not a demand shock to this level, not a demand shock like this, ever, has ever, never experienced a demand shock. This is a true demand shock that's coming to Bitcoin. And we have been programmed and trained to, we've been so well trained to experience supply shocks on Bitcoin. We have never, ever experienced a demand shock on Bitcoin. So the real question here you need to ask yourself is, do you truly understand what will happen to an asset when you get a demand shock like this? The Rolex Daytona had a demand shock in the previous, uh, you know, during 2020. And it went from a watch that's a $12,000 watch was selling for $60,000. Right. And what happened to that? Rolex replied by increasing their supply and making other adjustments to tamper down the market. Guess what? No, but guess what? Guess what? We cannot do with Bitcoin if we see Bitcoin go from twenty-five thousand to two hundred fifty thousand dollars to match an equilibrium price. We can't increase the supply. In fact, the supply goes down. So we're entering dangerous territory here. We're entering urgent territory here. If you want territory, some people, the hippies nowadays, don't care about territory, and that's cool. That's absolutely fine. But if you plan on having people live beyond you that are dependent on your decisions today, you need to understand how much territory do you want? Because you've got 21 million. 
That's it. You got 21 million. That's now 60, 60 million millionaires in the world. And you got 21 million of these Bitcoin. How much do you want your territory to matter to your progeny? That's the question here. Because this demand shock has never been felt. And there's no other asset on earth that it can be felt with. Because like gold, if, if $10 trillion wants to go into gold, suddenly all the governments start issuing gold permits to mine. What are you going to do with Bitcoin? You can't do anything. Can't, you cannot affect the supply. There is finality of supply on Bitcoin. Now is not the time to get complacent and start worrying about the economy, start worrying about what's going on, start worrying about, oh my God, when's the liquidity cycle going to change? These are all short-term things. Think long-term. Just think long-term. There are only 21 million Bitcoin. There is already, you know, worldwide liquidity of $900 trillion and all of it is going to want to change the prime asset. And the prime asset is Bitcoin. It can be everywhere and nowhere at the exact same time. It is solid and flexible at the exact same time. I can spend a fraction of it and I can store all of it at the exact same time. There is true finality of scarcity on this asset. And that's what makes it the best asset humanity has ever seen. Then you factor in the fact that we have never experienced a demand shock. We're talking about $20 billion, $25 billion going into it at the peak last time. And now you're talking about one vector causing a demand rush of $300 billion over the next five years. Not including the Forex market, not including uh, countries, not including, uh, you know, um, uh, high net worth families around the world, not including any of these, not including money coming out of real estate, not, inclu not including any of this. It is time that you start taking this seriously and stop mentally masturbating about the downside of Bitcoin when you are completely misunderstanding the demand side of Bitcoin, the upside of Bitcoin. It is imperative that if you want to stay relevant, you want your family to stay relevant, that you own a piece of this asset and you understand what is coming and you stop listening to the mental masturbations of deluded doom and gloom boomers, $10 a month DCA gang and the $1,000 net worthers. The scarcity is the asset, and we're about to see a demand shock like Bitcoin has never, ever seen before. So figure your shit out. You're running out of time. And the only question you need to ask yourself is, how close am I getting to my one Bitcoin? If you've got to one Bitcoin, how close am I getting to my second Bitcoin? If you've got to two, how close am I getting to my third Bitcoin? Because Bitcoin is going to price you out. As soon as this demand hits, it's going to price you out. Everyone's worrying about recessions. This circumvents any effect that the recession or credit cycles or anything has on the asset. Why? Because of the scarcity of the asset. This capital is already out there. There is already $900 trillion out there. I don't care if another dollar is not printed for 20 years, which won't happen. But I don't care if another dollar is not printed for 20 years. Why? Because the capital is already there. It's already out there. And we're about to approve an on-ramp for that capital. And $300 billion out of $900 trillion is nothing. And the reason why you need to get your shit together is because despite us talking about all of this, despite these new buyers coming in that will hold on to it and hug their Bitcoin like because they understand what an asset is and how long it should be kept and how to generate liquidity, they are far superior to you. These new buyers are far superior to you and I. Despite all of that, the three rules of Bitcoin remain the same. Step number one, you buy Bitcoin. Step number two, you shut the fuck up. And step number three, you get fabulously wealthy.